Uh, without much ado, um, I may not be able to really uh, accomplish uh, what uh, what was mentioned earlier about you know linking up the ecosystems approach to fisheries management to fish processing. I'll try my best. Uh, it's it's not really part of my general. Uh, you know, I've been talking about this for uh, uh, several years now, and this is not really part of my general of my general presentation. But I'll try my best to link it up, and maybe we can tackle that during the discussion portion. So I'll try to be to to limit my my presentation as much as possible so that I can have more time to to discuss. So for, first of all, let me show you the outline that I work on for this. I, you know, I've been using this lot of slides that I just been using before and try as much as possible to, to taper or to, you know, to, to design my presentation depending upon the audience. But I notice here that we have a multiple, you know, audience from different walks of life, uh, practically all fisheries, but maybe from different sectors. Uh, there's aquaculture here I've seen. There's also uh, fish, uh, mostly fish processing technology um, and maybe some some also on, on fisheries management. So if you feel that if you see that some of these are very redundant to you, uh, this is more designed for a, for a generic public such that you know uh, we will understand it as much as possible. So I'll go about some kind of an introduction about uh, and the introduction will talk about the declining fish stocks and what is why, why it's happening and maybe effects of fishing on the stock and effect, effects of fishing on the ecosystem. These are the two things that we want to, you know, to highlight because if we're talking about EFM, it has really have to uh, has to do with the ecosystem. Then maybe some some thoughts about overfishing. Um, I be, I've been doing this a lot even in my lectures during my time at UPV. So and of course the the, the standard control mechanism that our you know, our government or our, our various governments in in the world are using the types of control mechanisms. Some some examples uh, from the Philippines. So. And these examples are in terms of the management interventions that we're doing from simple to complex, I, I should say. Then, th then I go to the meat of our, of our talk, which is about the ecosystem approach to fisheries management and how it came about and why there is that need for that. And why is the uh, previous approaches like a species specific management or just, just simple management of the stocks uh, did not work and how, how those approaches that we've been doing for several decades somehow did not work. That's why we have to embrace uh, this concept of ecosystem support to fisheries management. Now, the last one is maybe about some thoughts about mainstreaming EFM in the Philippines. It's, it's probably where we could talk about, you know, the role of each sector in terms of mainstreaming EFM in the Philippines. And maybe that's how we would really uh, end up our, our, our so. There are a number of uh, slides that I also, uh, hide because I, I, I'm, I'm in the interest of time, but we can probably open them up if there's still enough time later on. This is about the emerging threats about uh, on, on, on our, you know, including climate change. But I think that's that's for, for another session if, uh, if, if, if there is an, if there's another one. Um, because I think what is key here is that for us to just focus on the uh, principles of EFM. So I always start with a very simple thing about showing why there is a decline in fisheries in our fish stocks. And that these are um, some studies that we have conducted several years ago when I was still at the university, wherein we put together, you know, troll surveys all over the country uh, that we can, uh, you know, that we, can, that we dig into, that we dig out from the, from the archives, from the, from the, you know, from the materials that was published by BFAR, by research institution. And we came up with this um, figure that our, uh, that the, based on troll surveys, we see, really see a decline in, uh, in, you know, in our fish stock, standing stock. This is a demersal stock densities based on various troll surveys in the Philippines from 1948, right after the war. I, I, I stopped here from 1995, but there are some recent surveys conducted by, you know, by BFAR, especially in Visayan Sea until I think last uh, this 2011 or even later much later you know just correct me i think about 2017 there was still an, an, one of the last surveys and um yeah so this shows really that there is a decline and you know in the context of stocks um the higher your 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 um variance that shows that the stock is from somehow still good because you can get big big catch you can uh, have small 
small volume of cats but you can also big uh, cats that's yung tawag nilang chamba no sa mga mangingisda so the more the stock is getting to be overfished the less na less and less you get this na tawag na chamba so kung, uh, hindi na gaano ang nagbavary and nagbavary yung mga yung variants natin or yung standard deviation then that also shows in our in our you know in, in this in, in this figure similarly if you look at this from various um, uh, areas in the country you will really see the decline in the, in the in the fish stock density all over the country and 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 in general we are just probably in terms of demersal stock uh, that is useful to us we're just probably just 10% of what we call the virgin stock in the 1940s so that's really that's the big decline that um, that we, we are in right now so that's really a very very uh, you know a very bleak uh, uh, future for us in terms of the standing stock but I'll, I'll talk about later on why why this is somehow um uh, yeah you know uh, there are some um some some things that happen like uh, what stocks that would benefit from the you know loss of other stocks and we'll talk about that later on as well so, so in the context of ecosystem so here uh, fish stock is also shown already in the early 80s now uh, you the study by out in the mid 80s show, shown by this Dalsel and Ganadin work uh, using the MSY I'll talk about MSY later on uh, as, a, as a basic concept for for our for our prep work in this and we show that in the in as, as early as the late late, uh, late 70s there were already some indication that we have reached the maximum sustainable yield so in the in their studies in 1995 just already declining so some work later on uh, showed really uh, so uh, um, somehow mirrored this 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 you know uh, the 1990s and 19, year 2000 work uh, of the M on MSY also mirrored this uh, this finding from you know from the 1985 of Dalcel and Ganadin and of course there are many uh, present, uh, um, you know this work from before uh, from the small scale fishers that shows that the cuts of each small scale fisher is uh, was an average of 1.6 tons every year has somehow declined to just about 1.1 tons from the period of 1987 to 1996 and this has somehow plateaued and kept, but going towards you know the declining trend trend and uh, Willie Campos came up also with this uh, work on on you know showing the cuts of 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 um of uh, uh i think this one is small pelagic um, uh, 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 ring netters when we saw when we initially look at the data we saw that the, the cuts are not really declining because if you if you consider it a catch per boat but when we look at it in the context of horsepower that means the amount of effort has, has increased because of the increase on horsepower we really we realize or we really campus you realize that there was really that decline and also you will know the colleague uh, the jingles um, uh, also made the study on blue swimming crab um, and this was continued all lately also by Cheryl from from uh, BFAR, uh, from NSAP and this showed that the blue swimming crab also if you look at it from from the individual fishers uh, there is no decline it seems that the cuts are, are maintained but when we look at it when, when he looked at it in terms of the number of panels you know gill nets are, are divided into panels so the more panels you have the longer is your gill net so when you, you look at it into num, uh, as a number of panels there was really that that decline in the catch and Cheryl has also continued this work and so this uh, decline to be to, to be sometimes uh, uh, just just level off but so, but also at some point also declining so these are really indications of what we have so why is this happening maybe you have to understand the the context or the concept of of what's happening uh, to a to a stock so what's happening really to our stock is that uh, our stock are is really this is a very very basic fisheries what fish 101 at uh, you know uh, this discussion or or um or, or um uh, figure uh, the stock is governed by several factors you know so the fa the stock can increase and, and, and the stock can also decline. So the stock here is defined as a group of uh, organisms, maybe just one species, or maybe a combined species in a particular area like a bay or a gulf or you know a space where they are they are really uh, uh, congregating or somehow where their life history is you know is, is somehow just uh, milling around. You now, so the stock is actually affected by several factors. One is that the stock continue to increase. Uh, mainly because it's uh, it's individual in, individual in the stock are growing, 
So the increase here is in, term, is in terms of biomass, not in number. No? But the, the stock continued to increase because of uh, the growth of each individual. So lumalaki, lumalaki ang, ang biomass. And the stock also continued to increase because they are reproducing, and we call that recruits or recruitment. So with these two factors, that those are these are the factors that will somehow continue to increase the stock. But that's not that's not the end of the story because these stocks are also dying, you know, of natural death. And practically, this is this is balances the increase of the stock, to maintain to maintain a certain kind of volume in that population. Now, that volume is balanced, but unfortunately, or fortunately for human beings, but unfortunately for the stock, the human beings get interested in it as a, as a source of food. So the stock is further declining or declined because of fishing. That's supposed to happen, you know? But in a sense, this is somehow uh, um, uh, reverted or this is somehow um, uh, contained because its individual stocks or its individual species has that tendency to really regain its own population by doing some kind of biological reactions. So the same, sometimes if fishing is just enough, the stock can still recover, mainly they can grow faster or they can even reproduce early. And these things also growing faster and reproducing early, that means that the life size at maturity of the stock becomes also the indicators of the scientists to find out if the stock is healthy or not. So if the stock continues to mature early, no, in base na mature sila ng two years, they are now maturing at an early year of 1.5. This is uh, these are indications that the stock are somehow uh, somehow um, uh, not properly or overfished, and somehow these are so this this reaction of the stock somehow we able it to maintain a secondary form of balance unless and this is what is happening most often is unless fishing is really becomes really really uh, increasing. So if fishing continues to increase, then it really tips off the balance in our stock. But if just if fishing is just enough, the stock can still be able to regain its volume or its uh, biomass, mainly because of responding to it. You know, so the, it's still following the the you know the survi sur survival of the fittest doctrine that we are you know that we are familiar with. So these are the these are the the, the 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 principles. I'll just talk about three principles here, uh, basic principle for stock uh, assessment and management that we will be needing for our you know for our for our discussion. The second one is about um, the surplus production, or this is what we use to estimate the maximum sustainable yield. You no, know, that is in our law. You know, the maximum sustainable yield is supposed to be the basis for managing the fish stocks in the country. You know, but there are some some issues with that that probably. Uh, we'll we'll tackle also early uh, later today, uh, later today. So, what happens here is that if you have fishing effort, so this is the number of boats, the number of fishers, and so on, you will have yield. So, if you have no effort, you have no yield. So, in this case, so I'll just go through this uh, simply by, by saying that if you have an amount, an amount of fishing effort, of course there will be an amount of harvest. And if you increase this fishing effort, of course, obviously your harvest will also increase. And obviously, if you look at this graph, it seems that it just keeps on going up and up. But of course, show, um, knowing that the stock has some limits in terms of its reproduction, it will need parent stocks to be able to reproduce. That means that it only reaches a point that wherein you can have the maximum fishing effort and you can only have a maximum fishing yield. Because if you go beyond this fishing effort, beyond the maximum sustainable yield, what will happen is that it will decline because you will already be decimating the, the stock in terms of you know hitting the, the, the appropriate volume of, um, of, of parent stocks. That means if you reduce the parent stock, there will be less and less um, um, uh, recruits in, in the future. So the, 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 the yield from the stock will surely decline. And that not only that is that if you look at it from the perspective of uh, money of, uh, of uh, say eco economics, what happens here is that if you look at the cost of fishing, so as you increase fishing of effort, obviously you will also be increasing the cost of fishing. But what happens here is that at MSY, that's practically your profit. So in beyond this point where this, this they cross, practically you are already lo losing from the stock in terms of your in your your cost of fishing. It's way beyond your maximum sustainable yield. Actually, it's happening, no? especially for small-scale fishers. 
uh, the max the effort is really beyond the cost that they that, you know the amount of the 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 value of the fish that they're catching they only tend to see this not not to see this because they don't value their fishing their effort that means they only value the catch and the market the marketing of the cats they, they don't value their their time at the sea so practically they don't they, they don't see this but what's good about this uh, this this um, this principle is that practically you can gain much about the, more from their stock if you are fishing less say for example if you are fishing somewhere a year you know the the the, the difference between your cost of fishing and the yield is very much higher you know this is what these are the principles that are being used by temperate countries wherein they have um, good management measures for their stock but even this no you know some 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 stock in the country in in, in north um north atlantic for example Manhattan, the cod has also has, has even collapsed so no? even with this with this with this principle with this uh, with this in mind so but in the country like the philippines practically we are not after the maximum economic yield you know we are after still about the maximum yield maximum sustainable yield because our base our use for our stock is not just about profit it's about food security so the more food you get if you are if you are looking at the msy rather than may because there, there is less less harvest in this regard anyway this is just the, the second uh, principle that i want to place in place it uh, place in here and the third one is a very simple uh, you know very simple principle but very very uh, somehow getting to be more and more relevant as we see what's happening around us. You know, before uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, I, I did not seem to, to you know, to to make use of this um, of this concept. Uh, but more and more, as we see it now, uh, the more that we see that this is getting to be very very relevant. Like for example, you know, the stock is in number of is, is, the stock size is in number. If it's better to look at this. Um, at this uh, figure from right to left no? that on your right side the number of recruits are very much dependent on the stock size the number of parents and you know uh, in in the sea as you reduce the stock due to fishing what happens is you also reduce the number of recruits you will notice that the reduction in the number of recruits is not that much even if you reduce the stock by half this is mainly because most of the stocks like small pelagics you know, are very, very resilient because they just, you know, they produce millions, you know, millions of individuals. And their survival, in fact, is just about, it's just about 1% or even less. But so the most of their, most of the recruits are even become food of the others. So the, 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 this kind of reduction of, of, rec of, of stocks may not even affect the, 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 the recruitment. But there comes a point when you continue to increase your fishing effort that you hit a point where in the, the very big change, you know, already from a point of just a small change in your stock size. So moving from here to here, for example, you will really already have been de 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 reducing a lot by already 25%. Where in earlier, you will not even notice this change. And this happens mostly to our small pelagic stocks that will you that's why you notice that the small pelagic stocks people tend, tend to believe before that they are inexhaustible that means they continue fishing and fishing and lately we realize that we are really and uh, uh, ha having a problem that's why you know before uh, our deremia would really somehow uh, uh, agree with me in this is getting into some measures like seasonal closure to be able to you know push further to push the stock to have more recruitment you no know, more, more recruits by not allowing people to catch us during the during the spawning period and that is to you know to boost the recruitment so that's the that's the one about this and altogether what i usually do when talking about this with the fishers uh, with our you know with our with our stakeholders altogether if we put all these three principles together i usually use this uh, very simple uh, simple animation you know a very very simple animation that if you have a ma maximum stock size you will be this will be this, um, this stock size or, or volume will be affected by two factors uh, it's going to decrease in stock size because of fishing because without fishing it is it's having its own natural you know balance now but with fishing you will have your tendency to reduce the stock size 
what happens is that, as I said earlier, that the, um, the fish tax has some kind of resilience. If fishing is just enough or not really that much, it can revert back to its original size because it has a tendency to, you know, to, to you know, to the, 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 the desire to survive. So it gets more of a, more, more of, as I said, uh, maturing early or even growing faster. And that means that it goes back to its original uh, stock size. Unfortunately, what we have been doing is that we are not contented with just the, this, this simple fishing. We tend to do, to overdo our fishing. So if we overdo our fishing, it's really impossible for this stock size now to go back to its original. Probably it's just getting round and round to its you know, secondary, secondary balance. And unfortunately, if we cannot you know, help it and continue to increase our fishing, then it will be really a big question if we really can go back to its original size. So this has been happening to many stocks in the country and these are happening already to, um, to our major. It only changed from one stock to another. That means uh, what happens is that when you overfish a certain small pelagic, probably the, by overfishing it, you will increase its, pre, pre, its prey because the predator is out of the, uh, out of the equation. And when the prey increases, that's when you see that you notice in the market that it's different type of group of fishes that you see, say, three or five years ago, because the predators have been overfished, and the prey has now is now uh, overwhelming the, the sea. And what happens is that as the predator again recovers, you will see them again in the market, and the the the, the prey probably will also be be reduced. So there's a there is that toggle back and forth from the from this cycle. Mainly because what we have been, what I've been showing you are just stock specific intervention, or stock specific uh, uh, principles. But if you look at this from the ecosystem, then it becomes really, really complicated. So you, can, you look at this from the ecosystem, uh, the effects of fishing on the ecosystem will be an entirely different, uh, will so somehow be a, a, you know, a similar picture, but we'll have the elements of the interaction between species as well as their food you know so in this case if we are looking at the trophic system wherein we have the primary producers which we don't really uh, which we don't really uh, you know harvest then we probably have primary consumers that part of it are being harvested then we have the secondary consumers that we are already harvesting and tertiary consumers this is that these are now the mostly predator fishes uh, these are you know usually the carni the carnivores that we are really uh, targeting because they are they, they tend to be have high value in the market. So if you look at this, you will see that their proportion to the overall biomass in the ocean is just about you know very very small compared to say to your primary consumers and secondary consumers. So when this is this happens and you overfish tertiary consumers, the secondary consumers may may may, may even increase. But then again, they will have a problem because the primary consumers may be may be uh, burdened by the increase in their you know in their their own predator. You know? So this is the balance, the balancing in the system that we have to be very very uh, you know very conscious about. So if you put in this together in a simple context of uh, fishing if, uh, effects of fishing in the ecosystem, maybe we could look at it better in terms of benefit you know what are we what is really beneficial to us you know so if you have fishing you're actually after the harvest mortality you want to harvest you know and when when you are when you're when fishing is just enough your harvest may even be be you know be be just just you know just uh, uh, good for the market and your your stock remaining stock can recover because you just harvested uh, just enough but you, if, if you harvested more than what you need or more than the stock can, can, you know, can sustain, then there is a problem. And there is, of course, other problem. You have fishing impacts of your fishing gear. So this is not what you wanted. And this fishing impact of your fishing gear will cause the incidental mortality. In this incidental mortality, we don't really benefit from it because mainly because they are probably left there on the, on the water. Maybe it benefits some of the prey they will be eaten by other fishes, but in a sense, from the perspective of the, the economic uh, fisheries as an economic activity, incidental mortality is not we are it's not what we are what really we want want we, we want. And this incidental mortality 
are mainly caused by illegal and 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 unregulated uh, uh, fishing gears, mainly fine mesh nets and so on, because they are not the ones that we are, or or maybe some blast fishing where in you know this the deaths of the fish are not even you know you don't even harvest all the fish that you have killed during blast fishing, and maybe some other gears that you know destroy that destroy the bottom, you know. So if you have and sometimes fishing can also cause bycatch. And these bycats may even be re re discarded back to the sea. And this is not being be benefited. And again, it becomes an incidental mortality. But the overall effect of this is that as you increase your fishing pressure, as your fishing effort, with all those corresponding um, uh, incidental, uh, incidental uh, uh, mortalities, as well as the effect on the ecosystem, what happens is you, 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 there will be a decline in your, you know, in your mean tropic level. So more and more of the, uh, or less and less of the carnivore are getting into the plate. More and more of herbivores. So that's why more of the sardines, more of the, yeah, some, some part the lungong, and more of them are, are, are what we see in the sea because we somehow decimated already the, you know, the, 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 the other stuff. So practically, Fishing is really not our problem, but really the problem is overfishing and of course the destructive fishing. Now I may want to, to you know to rest a bit and maybe ask you if, if if we are okay in terms of our you know of the 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 pace that I'm doing right now. So I already spent something like um, over thirty minutes <laughs> on this already, or about about twenty five minutes on this. What do you think? Are we still okay, or do you have any questions? You may, uh, yes, sir. We're okay. You may continue, sir. Okay, it's <laughs> okay. Baka, baka um, I, I hope yeah, you don't feel uh, you, you don't get sleepy. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so no, now when we talk about, I'll just run through this very quick. I know this is our basic fisheries uh, principles. Now the next, the next ones. So when you look at the overfishing, so what we did we did here with overfishing is that you know when you have a big, a problem like overfishing, you tend to have some some you will if you if you look at it from the perspective of just overfishing as a term, it tends to be very very uh, unwieldy. That means it's huge, and you seem to be to have no no response to it because it's really very very big as a problem. But some guys, uh, some people, uh, scientists, uh, uh, some biologists has thought out, uh, I think practically it's the, the, uh, Dr. Pauli, has thought out of, 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 of a way of looking at it. It's better to look at it along the way, along its, you know, its, its elements. Now, there are many elements of overfishing, or maybe some type, they call it types of overfishing. So there are, there are because over, uh, overfishing happens when fish are caught much faster than our, their ability to reproduce. That means we are practically reducing our stock size because we're catching at a faster rate than they were able to recover. So the, the, and the, this is the decrease in population. But it's better to look at it from, from its various, you know, from its various um, um, uh, types, because it's, you know, pag sinimahimay mo ang problema, mas madali mo siyang ma-respond just, just, than, than just looking at it from the perspective of, of a context of overfishing. So you talk about growth overfishing, wherein you, you know, ang, ang term ko dito ay, you are rubbing the fish of its growth. That means you are catching it at an early, early, uh, early stage. Recruitment overfishing. That means uh, you don't allow the fish to to, to go to increase its uh, its pinaparami uh, kanyang lahi because uh, you are catching so fast that you are already decimating the parent stocks. So konting ko konting nag 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 ano na bumabalik na recruits. And at the same time, you are destroying its um, its habitat. Its environment, so, so yung mga nursery ground niya, but nasana will support the recruits are, are are being destroyed. And ecosystem overfishing maybe is a context of what's what's affecting the you know the relationship among the the components of the fisheries there. And there's there's a fourth one which is economic overfishing. And let me let me just give you an example of all of this. So growth overfishing happens when you are you know giving a um, you are catching the fish before it a chance to grow. Here are examples that I, uh, easily, you can easily respond to if you are, say, a fisheries manager. So here in the, on the left, for example, these are the composition of various sardines. No? 
cuts in the in, in I think this was this one of my studies in Antiki in 1992, and it's obvious that the the that the bit same are catching even the young uh, individuals, but the others, the gill net, and uh, even the ring net and hook and line, are not catching them. No? so practically, if you want to to address uh, growth overfishing, already here, you know, you can you can you can already you know either remove the bit chain, already see to it that the mesh size are enough such that the young can escape. Here in among among the tuna, you know, for example, here in the various areas in the world, we notice that the tuna being caught in the Philippines because of our payao are also so contributing to growth overfishing because we are catching the much, much smaller tuna compared to you know, the regular cats in the rest of the world. So we're catching more of the, of the young from 10 to 39 centimeters. This is our immature tuna. And mainly because tuna, uh, especially this is about big eye, I think this, well, sorry, this is about yellowfin, yellowfin tuna because yellowfin tuna, um, um, uh, they, they school together. So for example, the immature yellowfin tuna school together with uh, skipjack, uh, the, the same size, but actually the skipjack are already mature, and they, but the yellowfin tuna is still immature. So when, you, when the, when the, when the parsine or ring net catches them, uh, there's a tendency especially to catch also. And there's a very, very high percentage of, 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 uh, of very young uh, yellowfin tuna in the cats. And of course, the, for recruitment overfishing, these are just the stages of maturity of the various species that we found, I think I think this is Manila Bay, if I'm not mistaken, or, or San Pedro Bay in one, one of, my, of my studies. And we noticed that the stage four, which is our the mature, are getting to be really, really very, very small in terms of its percentage. These are percentage. So which means to say that there we are, this is a very young, uh, the, the very young, so in fact, some, some very, very, very young uh, stocks. Uh, and there is now this indication that the, that the parent stock are getting to be less and less. And obviously, we're going to have a problem when it comes to recruitment overfishing. And ecosystem overfishing is shown in this diagram by just showing the what is a normal intact uh, uh, stocks or, or, or multi-species stocks. And what happens when you are, do, uh, when you are doing over, uh, ecosystem overfishing, what happens is some of these stocks uh, in, in dark end and in, with, with question mark are already out of the picture. That means they are already probably uh, depleted and it will change the composition of your, uh, of your stock. And I can show this in this various, very, very, um, um, this is a very, um, um, my, one of my studies that I did in Manila Bay, for example. Um, I took in uh, the cuts production of Manila Bay uh, and group it into, into five years. And I noticed that these averages, five-year averages kept on increasing from 1961 to 1990s. Uh, that was my, my studies around the 1990s at that time. So, but the Junjun Torres of uh, BIFAR, uh, of NFRDI is continuing this study. So there are some new uh, insights on this already. Uh, and also the, 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 I noticed, but so if you were, um, if you were a manager of Manila Bay, uh, how would you say, how would you, how would you agree when a person says that this is already overfished? And at that time in 1980s, uh, Ronquillo already said that this, the, 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 no, the, the Manila Bay is already uh, overfished, you know, the, the, but then we, we, when, we, when we look at, so you cannot sense, uh, you know, you cannot put sense in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the statistics that says you are increasing in production, but you say it's overfished. So parang walang logic don. But when we saw the composition of the cuts, we saw that more and more, of the squid and shrimp, there's some more and more in, in vertebrates is getting into the cuts of the troll during the troll surveys, than say than the fin fishes, and these are indication now of a, a shift in the in the in the in, in the ecosystem. But the shift in the ecosystem can also be you know uh, argued by the fishers, for example, in this case because squid and shrimp have more value, have higher value during this time of the study, have, have, they have higher value than the fin fishes. So how am I to say that this, this, you know, this, this, uh, this, this, this is overfish? But then I get into this comparison of the cuts, the survey in 1947. No? So the 1947 data by the, I think that was, um, uh, that was a data uh, by Warfel, by Dr. Warfel, Warfel and somehow uh, with, with uh, Mr. Manakop of BIFAR. Uh, they were able to, I, I put together their data in terms of the families. And compare it to the families that I got during my study in 1993. 
And here, here you can see that the shift in the family composition is really, really very evident. So obviously, this is, a, this is now what you get when you uh, see ecosystem overfishing. And obviously, together with the growth, with the recruitment, and of course, with ecosystem overfishing, what happens is that if you have good fish, if you have good catch, if you have a good ecosystem, if you got stock, practically your fish are much bigger. And of course, the value per kilo would be higher. But if you have decimated the, the, you know, the, the predator uh, and the catch are much, much less, you know, much, much less palatable, of course, the value of that will be very low. And that's, uh, and that's, the, that's, that's the, just the, the context of the economic overfishing. And adding to that, you would have to kill more fish because they are very small to be able to reach a kilo. So instead of just 20 a kilo for this size, maybe you will need something like 60 pieces or, or, or 40 pieces to achieve a kilo for this, for this small fish. So more and more pressure on the, on the system. So it's, it's, a, it's a catch 22 that uh, more, more or less uh, we are getting into. So that's about overfishing. So in terms of the response, of course, we have types of, we have been responding to this in terms of control mechanisms. And we said that um, we can, we have two types of control mechanisms. And that's what, what is, uh, this is all over the world now. This is all, all over the world in terms of the, the mechanisms for managing the fisheries. We have two types of um, control mechanisms. It's the input controls and the output controls. Now, just to, just to, just for you to get, go through this, uh, uh, you know, quickly. Uh, the, the input controls, you know, are mainly uh, uh, recognizable if you answer this question. Who does the fishing? So if you control the number, the types of people going to the fishing, you know, if you have registration and licensing, if you have, if you, you know, if you, you, uh, you allow only the number, the right number of people, who does the fishing, then you have some kind of control, input control mechanism. When they can fish. So if you have, you know, some spawning, peak spawning period that you don't allow people to fish, you know, our people don't, you, you know, catch only during the, 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 the new moon, but not during the you know, full moon. Of course, that's a, that's, a, that's a kind of control mechanism. And where they can fish, you know, so allocating si uh, spaces for, you know, for, for a particular fishing gear. This is where the hook and line should be. This is where the gears that are using, you know, drug nets should be, you know, like what we do with commercial and municipal fisheries. This is some kind of... Um, of a control mechanism of using the question of where they can fish. And the last one is how they can fish. The types of fishing gear, or maybe controls in the mesh size, the controls in the hook size, and of course, preventing you know, types of gears like you know, gears that destroy the bottom or gears that are you know, using you know, uh, bombs or dynamites. So that's about input control. And the output controls is about you know, restrictions restrictions of what you are going to, what is the output from the fisheries. The input is about what you put in into the fisheries and the output is what you get out of the fisheries. So you, you restrict the size of, you know, that blue seeming crab matures at around 11, 11 centimeters. So people are now putting in um, mechanism as the restriction of size of harvest. And of course the restriction of the states at maturity, that means you don't harvest uh, the buried, buried or gravid uh, individuals or buried crabs. That's a restriction, uh, that's uh, an output control restriction. And in advanced countries, they have catch limits or bag limits. So for example, you allocate 50 or 50 fishing boats in, in Visayan Sea, and each of this boat has some kind of a catch limit that, that when they reach already that catch, you know, they, they stop fishing. But of course that's not happening yet in the country. But that's happening already in the in the in the in North Atlantic. No, you, you probably have, you have seen this uh, you know this um, uh, TV show about you know deadly catch where India they are just limited in terms of time and the the number of fishes that they can bring for a season. No, so that this is about control mechanism. So putting all this together, the input and output control, we somehow look at it in terms of you know. The types of interventions from, from simple to complex, uh, complex, the fisheries management intervention. This is just a run through of the intervention. So I may, I may run through this quite quick. But, but what I'm going to do is that um, I will share this uh, slide no, to the, to the uh, secretariat, you know, uh, sharing this um, I, I'll, because it's a, bit, it's a bit big. 
So I might I might send this through uh, through a Google Drive uh, and uh, maybe share it with the, the they can they can share it with you at some point um, this week or so on. So that so I'll just go to this quite quick, but maybe uh, so the fisheries management interventions that we are doing no uh, in the country and maybe this this um, this is more of what I have been involved with uh, in the past say when I left the university even when I was still with the university and this is much of what what, what I was involved with uh, you know uh, being out of the university I get to be more and more uh, doing not just the research but really implementing the, the, the you know the results of the research that means um, we are we are really um, going to to the ground so the most common intervention in the country is still the marine protected area maybe many of you have uh, are, are doing this already or helping out in doing this uh, and it has very very it is very very successful to some extent that practically all over the world um, uh, maybe we are known for for that and we have even up the ante at some uh, at, on this uh, we are getting to into complex you know uh, uh, mpas right now so simply because mpas are uh, in fact we noticed it during our early project in the early 20, uh, 20, uh, 1999 so some, something like 2020s we noticed a little that the understanding of the mpa um, serve as entry point for community participation in fisheries management and it also serve as a laboratory for fisheries management here the sea fish grow and the sea fish getting to be harvested bigger and this is about you know putting into action some of the principles that i have discussed earlier so the uh, by protecting the, the by, by protecting an area and you know you know catching only outside it a spillover uh, this get to be more and more you know common no so and it's also a way of engaging the community uh, with ngos and even with the government so because uh, we know that uh, mpas uh, require some kind of uh, ordinance that the local government uh, uh, you know that is the mandate of the local government and it will require some kind of uh, support from people's organization and non-government organization especially in, the, in their establishing in their establishment now now we introduced some principles here. Now, uh, this is a work we, that I uh, that I have done together with uh, well that work that we co conducted with uh, Willie Campos and Dr. William Noy. Uh, this is just an example. We've done this already in several places in the country, wherein we uh, we we try to establish network no, of MPAs. But in but in establishing network, it has to be sort of supported by science. So first of all, uh, Dr. William Noy, um, uh, K. William Noy came up with a hydrodynamic model. Of the you know of the of, of, of the area, uh, where does the where is the prevalent you know movement of the sea of the movement of the current such that when you know where the fish are being recruit or where the recruitment happens, you know where they can be settling because they can be moved uh, uh, you know a larvae can only be moved by currents now they cannot swim on their own yet uh, so with that uh, we did and we did some simulation. Simulation is like a dye, you know, you just put in a color and see where this color gets through. So if you put in a dye in one of the squares and see that if this dye moves to another place, that means that's where the movement of the current is. And really came up with a study on the, on the, no, on the larvae, larval distribution. So we match the current with the larval, uh, with the larval study and in, and envision how they are going to be, how the, lar the, the, larv the larvae are going to be distributed all throughout the, the now. This is the now reef in, in Northern Bowl. And with that, we came up with, with you know, with, uh, with, uh, with go, no go, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 figures saying that the, the MPAs that we can support and the MPAs that we, are, we cannot support because the MPAs that we can support are those that will be benefiting from the, the, you know what the, what they called as the um, uh, uh, as the you know the sink the, the, the sink and and the source no so the the source and the sink principle where the, the where, where the larvae came from and the sink is where they are going to settle and this MPAs will be the one to be you know to to to, uh, to either be being a sink or being also a source so this is the MPA that we we ideally they both have to be sink and, and source but in some cases uh, some MPAs just become source and maybe less of a thing, but of course it, co it contributes to the entire ecosystem. So with this, the design of MPA becomes more and more, you know, complex in a sense because we tend to, you know, 
to agree, to use some 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 management principles or some some ecosystem principles uh, to be able to you know so getting into the ecosystems approach to fisheries uh, you know this is what we are we are you know that's what that's what we are really trying to do, to do here now not just focus on one MPA but network of MPAs that we want to so that support each other so an MPA we have say a success or maybe have some kind of benefit say if you the benefit of the MPA is twenty percent. Maybe by putting it in a network, you can increase by the benefit by double or uh, maybe, but it always increases the benefit because you're putting it in a, net, in a network. And then we look at applying ecological principles. This is very, very simple things like, for example, uh, the scale analysis. We want to say if the scale is, 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 we need to increase the scale of the MPA than, than just its current scale in the, in the shape. Would you love? Would you have a circular MPA or a cigarette shape MPA? Of course, the circular shape MPA or the squares are more beneficial than the cigarette shape MPA. And the minimum distance between MPA by studying the you know the range the range of uh, of the species around, uh, you will come up with the minimum distance between MPAs because that's the one that where the MPA will will survive. You know, I mean the 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 the, the sink and sources will somehow be effective with that uh, with that range. And habitat representation, of course, as much as possible, we want to incorporate as much as possible all the three, all the reef, mangrove, and seagrass habitats, because it's of these have their own have their own value, have their own role. Some species will need uh, seagrass to be able to for their nursery, and will have need mangrove even for you know for for them to you know to to, uh, to for feeding and some and so on. So there, this this have various various uh, uh, use. And, and, and recently, we even come up to the point that we are incorporating now the climate. No? So we're incorporating um, long-term long -term, long -term, um, temperature um, uh, measurements and see where probably MPA needs to be um, increased in terms of its size or increased in terms of being redundant. That means more uh, added, add more MPAs because there is that potential that uh, the climate may, the, cl the temperature may affect the increasing, ever increasing temperature may affect it. And maybe also finding a way, ways where in the temperature, the areas that are visited by high temperature, somehow you notice that this, um, that we, or you, you happen to notice that the, the corals there seem to have survived. So this can, this can become, uh, uh, you know, um, a resilient uh, uh, habitat that really are become good candidate for become um, for for your MPA network, so we are incorporating also the the uh, climate variables, uh, temperature as well as you know acid acidific uh, ocean acidification, and that's the the MPA. And we have some simple uh, you know simple interventions like you know knowing that the blue swimming crab harvests at ten or 11, 10, 10 centimeters. So some will there are now ordinances, especially we we are working together with BFAR now. Some ordinances along the municipalities which harvest blue swimming crab, such that we can, you know, and this is in the national management of blue swimming crab. I may be wrong here with the with the in with the centimeters. I think there's something more than 12 centimeters that's being recommended by NMP. Just correct me, me, me if I'm wrong. Um, so the 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 point is that uh, we are going to introduce the principles here, which is a simple, you know, species like blue swimming crab. So preventing the catching of buried. Crab and in some 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 municipalities are impounding buried females when in fact you are not supposed to catch them you are supposed to return them to the sea but some are going to the point of impounding them such that they will allow them to you know to to reproduce so buhol they call it na para makapagyagyag and you know then they then and also maybe uh, there is uh, that uh, that the zoning of crab uh, fishing gears because we notice that it's not about the the it's about it's not about the fishing gear. It's about the location where the fishing gear is being deployed. Like for example, in this case, the, the, the figure here is, is the crab gill net and the figure at the bottom is the crab pot. But here at the bottom is the crab leaf net, which are being deployed very, very near the shore. So practically these are the, the, crab, the gears that catches very, very small crabs. And these are the gears that are catching the bigger crabs. So it's a matter of, you know, zoning maybe preventing people from uh, you know, catching in the, in the in the shallower area. So we have we have the science, and it's more of the the implementation that that goes with it. 
You know, and then we have also very simple ones like, for example, the beach chain, and I guess uh, coastline of Miagao, the Antique, and, uh, and so on are very, very uh, notorious for this. In this case, they are catching a set, a, a set of shrimp. So they call it pink shrimp in the area. But unfortunately, this shrimp, this catching of shrimp, <laughs> catches with it the other juveniles. And we, are, we, are, we have even sold cellar chrominophthalmos, show them that there are plenty of cellar chrominophthalmos because they go near the shore to feed during this, after the spawning period. So when we looked at this, you know, so we thought that maybe getting to a certain type, kind of system, not, not directly preventing people from fish because you are allowed to catch uh, surgisted shrimp, but using fine mesh nets, but only at a certain time. But now what they did is that they are catching all, all, all throughout the year. When we, but when we notice that Sergis Tits is only present during February to May. So what is about what, what happened here is that during the, the intervention here in Lanusa Bay, uh, we were able to convince people not to catch during June to August up to January. No, but of course, some of them will have to you know, adjust to it. That means some of them only do it before the, the February. Some of them do it only after the June. That means they are not totally... Um, um, doing it all uh, the way we, we, we plan. But anyway, there's something, there's something, there's some de development here. And the other one is the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the just seasonal closure of Dangit. And this is very, very simple because Dangit happens to just be, just become mature or become um, gravid or ready to spawn or their spawning period is on the third, fourth and fifth night you know, after the new moon. So it's very simple, just closing those, night, those nights. And that, that happened and started in Palonpon and is repeated all throughout Palonpon Leyte and is, is repeated in, the, in our project sites before. And it's now getting to be a norm in terms of the, the now sometimes na, na, enthusiasm, then they go back again to doing the, you know, that, that period. Then it's a very big sacrifice for the fishers because when, when, when we did the baseline, we noticed that the, during this new moon, no. Uh, especially the three, the three nights after that, is the time when they are really very, very abundant in the area. So there's a lot of sacrifice for the for the fishers as well. But when they catch, when they close it during those times, they realize that the catch the following year uh, are really increase because they prevent catching of the of the uh, of the gravid uh, individuals during this new moon. And we have some seasonal closure also done in, you know, in uh, this is con conducted by the LGU together with BIFAR, but specific for the LGU. And we did this for, you know, for the Stiliger and the other small pelagics, uh, the Capteros in, in Balayan Bay. And this was, this was done through, you know, series of work with the fishers themselves. So the, it's really, it's really um, bottom up. This is the fishers that really triggered this. And what happened here is that uh, we just put the science to find out which is which part of the year has the most gravid, gravid individuals. And we realized that this is during the month of December. So people this just started closing this for one month a year. And since we know we get this information from the fishers where they are catching the, the buried, uh, the, uh, the, the gravid individuals and where they find you know, the mature individuals. And from them, we really were able to get to the point that we really were able to close during those periods that they that 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 the science recommended, but of course we know that ideally it's supposed to be closed for three months from during the bear months, but they only can afford to close for one month because it's going to affect their life. But it's better than but better than nothing. Now it is an it is a really um a continuous activity now, and it's not just in Balayan Bay. It's happening now all throughout the province of Batangas. And we're very, very glad for that, that we served the impetus in doing that. Now, so these are the series of pictures of what we did with, with the stakeholders in terms of you know, doing some studies on the, uh, on the reproductive biology and so on. Now, anyway, there is also that broader close, regional closure of Galunggong in the Northern, in, in Northern Palawan. This was also um, uh, uh, to, together with the, with the commercial fishers and practically, the information here, if you notice, there are some, some, some satellite data here of the, of the chlorophyll concentration, as well as the night lights. So kitang kita na there's a high activity within the area to be closed. And this also the coming from the commercial fishers themselves. They notice yung mga kapitan ng mga barko, yung mga maestro pescador, you know, the, 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 the fishing boat, the, the, the you know, my, my master fishers. 
they provide us with information where they see the the gravid gravid individuals are. So with that, we were we, the BFAR was able to come up and and the ILG was able to come up with the joint uh, administrative orders for decisional closure. But this is a very very, very telling picture that I like to tell you about. Now, uh, this shows compliance. So in September, October, and November, there were still night flights. Uh, this is a, this is this is a, a, a aggregation of lights during that that month. And in December, we see that there was a night line. What's good about this is that the 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 jiao was delayed. It came out only I think late December because the closure is until January or February. Uh, but still, since the commercial fishers were already on board from the very beginning and they know there's supposed to be a closure from November to January, so there were less and less fishing in November and practically there was no fishing in December. And that's really about compliance in a sense. Now, uh, talk too much about you know about this, but there are still some issues that we we have we want to tackle. Now I want to finish this in say at, at 10 30 so we have plenty of time to, to discuss. So here is a is a figure that even with all those interventions, increasing in catch, increasing in production, we still have some issues to tackle. So for example, in this, I call this winners and losers. That in this process of doing that, we have the winners. And we have still losers, even if we have increased the biomass, you know, we have increased the catch. Because mainly because we still don't allocate much in terms of our, you know, of our, of our, you know, of our, um, of, of the equity. So the policies are not yet enough because oh, still the lo losers are the multiple hand line, bot bottom set, long line. And the winners are the Danish saying that is this in Bohol, no? fine mess nets and fish coral. Stationary, stationary leaf net and round house sign. Mostly fishing gears that can be afforded only by, you know, by, by upper scale fishers. That means there's a lot of, um, of capitalization for this. So this is still an issue. So even, so we, even we see success in, most, in, in this intervention, for example, in the project that I had in the year 2000, up to 2007, this has happened, but we saw that we are still not there because we lose still. So in a sense, we, we are trying to, re, to, to, uh, to, uh, to remedy this by looking at an ecosystem perspective of right sizing. Uh, this is based on, a, on a, you know, an, an ecosystem model, wherein we use the ecosystem model to balance the biomass or to see what's the biomass and, and the contribution of its fishing boat, of its, of its fishes in the area, species of fish in that area. As well as the, the the effect of the of the fishing itself, uh, you see fishing fishing as some kind of uh, because it is a trophic model, no. So we use also fishing as some kind of um, of, an, of a predator in itself, no. So fishing is a predator in this case by using this model, and in this case we allow we we want to see what's the proper uh, allocation of fishing gear. So we run a simulation, and we agree with our with our with our stakeholders on what. Uh, what is the appropriate um, uh, fishing gear and ultimately they can come up with you know with allocation of fishing gears in terms of what they are supposed to register or to license in this area so it's still a very com it's still um it's uh, we have shown this already in several we have done this already in some uh, several with some degree of success and also not so good success in some areas but we see that this is the only way because as i mentioned earlier you can talk about stocks but when you talk about stocks you may lose that vision about the ecosystem because if you You have to always to consider it into, into our equation. So this, this type of approach is what we are trying to do now to bring in ecosystem, ecosystem principles. And practically, this is what one of the tools that we see that EFM will, 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 you know, will be enough. So now let me get into how EFM came about. No? This is just a series of, I think, three to four slides. So in the past, the FAO realized that whatever agreement among the countries, it, seems, it doesn't seem to work. 
And one of the very big failure for this is that because we look at fish as tax, as commodity, and we look at them in terms of biomass, the harvest, and we look at them in terms of the, the benefit, economic benefit, not even social benefit, because the, it only come, came in later about looking at labor and so on. But mostly it was, it was looked up more of a, of a commodity wherein it will become useful to the society that becomes uh, you know, profit. So for a country like the Philippines, wherein our approach to fishing, our, 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 our need for to, to catch fish is not just about profit, but also about food security, then that becomes really very, very complicated. So as, as the FAO see this problem, they realize that there is a need to come up with a, with a responsible fisheries. So the, 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 the idea of coming up with um, uh, CCRF, no? So the, 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 no, the uh, Conference for Responsible Fisheries uh, is, becomes, uh, becomes really, uh, be, uh, you know, this, was, uh, this came, came alive you know, during, during this time. So these are now the time series that I could show in terms of how this, uh, how this came about. So it took some time. No? So in the 1970s, there were already UN conventions in the 1980s. There were stock agreements in the UN, but actually this, this, this all we were not really that that successful until they came up with a, with a, you know with a, with a declaration of the responsible uh, fishing so the code of conduct for responsible fisheries was unanimously adopted in 1995 uh, it is a set of recommendations so practically <laughs> its country are expected to follow but these are just recommendations because it's a code of conduct so obviously uh, a country may not follow uh, and we see that now that some countries are, that are just ignoring that. Uh, we, we know them also. But what is important in this in this history is that to be able to 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 uh, implement CCRF, you need to have some kind of a practical means of doing that. And the practical means of doing that is that is is being brought into the ecosystems approach to fisheries management. Practically. For for uh, FAO, they call this ecosystems approach to fisheries. They, do, they are not they are not using the word ma man manis, management mainly because this is management in the, in the first place. That's their argument. No, but in our in our case, we are using this as a ecosystems approach to fisheries management because probably we want to, to differ from what we have been doing in terms of fisheries management. No, the the, the usual one, which I will show show later on. No, uh, so. The, it is defined here now just for the purpose of you having the, the notes, maybe not so as not you don't have to, to come up with the notes. Uh, the ecosystems approach to fisheries uh, by the FAO is an approach to fisheries management and development that strives to balance diverse societal objectives. So this time around, we, have, we see now the diverse societal objectives. That means it's not just about the economic uh, value, but, and not just the biomass value, but even the, you know, the, the human well-being value by taking into account the, the knowledge and certain things about biotic, abiotic, and human components of the ecosystem. So human component here becomes really, really very, 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 uh, very tangible. Unlike before, they only look at biotic and sometimes abiotic and their interaction and in applying the integrated approach of fisheries within ecological and meaningful boundaries. So here the boundaries becomes also a very, very big factor because you have to, you have to um, superimpose your boundary with the governance of that boundary, of that species or the fisheries in that, in that covered boundary, which we will be uh, discussing later. This includes taking an account in, uh, for the tropical development country context. Of course, this will include taking into account the fragility of the coastal ecosystem, particularly the coral reef system. And that's just the coral reef, of course. We have the mangrove and seagrass. The multiple sectoral uses, the multiple species and multi nature of the fisheries in the, their, and the various needs of the coastal communities. So various needs of the coastal communities. Now maybe here we try to fold in now what happens after the fishing. You know? And then that's where I think you will come in in terms of you know, post harvest and so on and the supply chain and so on. Because the various needs of the, com the coastal communities are that are, are, are somehow embedded into this. No? So I, I mentioned to you earlier that I may not have the, you know, the specific example for, for this, but we can really uh, tune into that particular aspect of the human well-being, as well as the contribution of the value chain to preventing catching more. 
you know you are preventing uh, uh, overfishing in a sense because you increase more of more and more of the value in your value chain by getting more i uh, say equity for the people who had less equity from before as i've shown also earlier and so on uh, and maybe that's the the concept the context that we are getting into so an ecosystem approach to fisheries management pro, uh, provides a practical and realistic way to sustainability to, to sustainably maximize societal benefits from fisheries and coastal resources by finding a balance this is the most important one by finding a balance between ecological and human well-being through good governance so these are the these are the the big words that we are usually uh, uh, using the finding the balance between ecological and human well-being and i think this is what is embedded in most of bfars you know uh, 10654 right now uh, the the human well-being part uh, uh, and the ecological part so we now equate because before we try just to focus on the ecological well-being of the of the species there but really we are now really finding out that focus on the human well-being and of course the the generator for this is the good governance or the the, the, the you know the the, bal the balancing of this is through good governance so when you look at ecological components you just not look at the target fish species so we are we have been that's why i've been mentioning about multi-species uh, tar even targets and non-targets even the bycats even the incidental cuts the food chains no? the habitats and the envir environmental co conditions now in the future so thinking about climate change and so on is really a very big component of efm not just you know not just the, the, the current, no? not just a particular group of fishers, but various types of and scales, other resource users, fish buyers, boat owners, fish processors, and other se sectors, even outside the fisheries, uh, tourism, agriculture, energy, and maritime. So it's, a, it's some, kind of, some, some kind of encompassing right now, uh, the way they're, they're, we're looking at uh, ecosystems approach to fisheries management. It's not just about the species, not just about the stocks, it's not just about the habitat where the stocks are, the biotic and the biotic part, but it's really about it's really folding in the, the, the human well-being. And I think why, why ecological scale? Because, you know, when you look at the species, it's in, in the boundaries that they have, you may have an artificial boundary when in fact, your species are moving from, say, from outside your bay to inside your bay. And maybe from the point of view that the species are, 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 are maturing, are, are, are becoming mature outside far away from, you, from land, but becomes useful to uh, that make use of the land for their spawning. And that becomes a very, very, very important uh, factor in our, in our ecosystem approach. And of course, there's the scale, no? the ecological scale that has to be with the governance scale. In the case of the Nahon, this is what we experience. We look at four municipalities, uh, we work together with, with us an alliance, and we realized that it's working very well. When we expanded to, to a broader scale of municipalities, it still worked. When we had a bigger scale, like the Komote Sea, because there's still governance scale at that time, that we somehow did, 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 did not work. And so we see that there is a to balance the ecological scale, scale. even if you are multiple uh, species uh, thinking about the multiple stocks in, in, in mind but really we have to balance uh, the, the governance scale and that's what we've been dealing in the past few years that's why in the past few years remember that uh, i don't know many of you the young people may not have may not know about this but people you have have gone to the man and the management units for the country is in terms of base and goals so we're managing ring that was in the 90s up to the 1980s so we're managing the base we're then managing the goals but at that time there was still no local government code so this are practically being managed to be far so san miguel bay uh visayan sea is in fact also one of that and we have the 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 lingayan gulf Arigar, and so on particularly the manage the management scale but at that time there's no management unit this 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 is just a are just maps showing where bays are and what is supposed to be the stocks in those bays science perspective but the intervention are somehow uh, um, uh, somehow uh, geared towards helping out provinces or municipalities as, as as together to be able to manage but practically it's being managed by 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 bfar you know? so this and and this says uh, on your left this shows the important elements of our system 
So they, they, they you know, this gray, this gray uh, very, very light areas are actually the system that are really supporting our, 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 our production. Because these are the uh, areas with, which are still photic zone. That means this is the area where you still have this rich by, by sunlight. And these are the areas which are very, very productive. But beyond that, these are just, produce, these are just pelagics, uh, large pelagics that are moving around. In the sense that the, our concept of bay management somehow has, 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 some, has some principles behind it, some principles behind it. So, but when the local government came in, then, then came the municipal, and that somehow, uh, somehow already uh, uh, introduced the, the issue about management. Because if you have two management bodies, municipal municipality, and of course, before beyond municipal waters, that somehow, because your stock is not just confined to municipal waters, it goes from to, to you know beyond municipal waters, and it goes from another municipal waters to uh, other municipal waters. So that's that's the, the concept of the of the, and we like we started looking into the the management integrating management area. So if you are from Visayas, we've seen of this the the various uh, attempt of people to in alliances, and this is a very very natural uh, reaction attempt because we know because this we realize that our government our stakeholders are, are aware that the fish are not are not confined to their municipal boundaries you go beyond that so by allying uh, by having an alliance they somehow cover uh, the you know the stocks that are also being shared by, by by these various municipalities so that's this is just an example this is happening all throughout the country and lastly uh, we have the fisheries management board uh, we have now the fma uh, we're in, we have, so I mean, it's, we, are, we, we, we now have some kind of putting together a governance system. And at, the, at, some, at, at this point, we only have 12 FMAs, wherein we mentioned this before, during our work, earlier work with BIFAR in the year 2000, we thought of having smaller, you know, smaller areas, which are very, very, um, these FMAs tend to be wieldy uh, because it's huge. But somehow this, is, this does not preclude people getting into sub -MAs. So the, this can be, uh, and this FM is as, as, uh, supposed to have an FM management plan, as a management board, as a science advisory group. And I, I know some of you here are members of the science advisory group. And they are about supposed to be developing harvest control rules or harvest control rules for the stocks within those FMAs. So that's how we are. So maybe I may not have talked a, a lot about, um, about uh, uh, post-harvest in this sense, but remember that when you're doing after the fishing activities, you tend to see it, it as a product. But if you look at it as a, as a product or a, a, a control mechanism that will enable people to catch, uh, catch um, so to harvest uh, responsibly, you know, the, the responsible harvesting is the, is the key here. Uh, this sustainable harvesting may be a word because that's, that's quite unachievable. But responsible harvesting, if you get into responsible harvesting, practically your intervention in the post-harvest will tend to reduce the pressure in the sea. And that's how I always link the activities of the fishery. And much, much, much more, which is important in EFM, the equity. You know? The more you, you see in your value chain, in your value chain, that uh, as you as you as you unpack your value chain, you tend to put in intervention such that more of the players, especially down the line from the catchers, you know, to the aggregators, maybe more and more that we see where the where the where the benefit should come more, especially if you improve the product in terms of increasing its value along the. So I just want to, to link that up, but I, 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 I reserve here some kind of 30 minutes, uh, maybe 30 minutes because I think closing remarks from RDRM, yeah, uh, allow for that. So guys, thank you. I, I think I have talked too much already. Uh, this is already about, um, yeah, more than, more than an hour. <laughs>